So final preparations. Uh, in this chapter, we'll perform a few additional tasks to prepare for building the temporary system. We will create a set of directories in LFS, which will install the temporary tools, add an unprivileged user, and create an appropriate build environment for that user. Also explain the units of time the SBUs are used to measure how long it takes to build LFS packages and to provide some information about package test suites. So first of all, we've got to create a limited directory layout in the LFS file system. So several commands here. Now you can copy and paste all these commands in one go, but um, it's probably best if you do one at a time. It's a bit more onerous, but it does mean that if anything happens, if you get an error or something happens that's unexpected, you're more likely to notice it rather than it being embedded amongst all the other commands that you've pasted in. So we'll just do one at a time. The output looks okay from that, so we'll do the next one. This is one command in itself. It's just got another command embedded in it, so we need to copy all that in one go. That looks good. And again, this case command, and this is one of these commands I was saying where it's looking for a particular type of architecture. So in this case, it's looking for 64-bit architecture. And that means for a 32-bit, this command won't do anything. But for a 64-bit, it will create this directory here, lib64. And you can see it's done that because it says it's created the directory. So again, although I've just said it won't do anything with 32-bit, you can copy and paste it in. You can see that it won't do anything because you won't get any output. It won't do any harm to put it in. Now we need to create a tools directory to store some temporary tools. And you can see it's created it. Um, it says here as a note, the LFS editors have deliberately decided not to use a user lib64 directory. Several steps are taken to be sure the tool chain will not use it. If for any reason this directory appears, either because you made an error in the following, in following the instructions because you installed a binary package that created it after finishing LFS, you may break your system. You should always be sure this directory does not exist. Okay, that kind of contradicts what I just said actually. So I'm not quite sure what's happened there because we have just created an, a lib64. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's a user lib64 directory. Right, okay. Uh, so basically, I presume that anything that would uh, try to be installed in lib64 is going to be installed in... Sorry, in user lib64 is going to be installed in lib64 under the root. So that's something to bear in mind if you veer away from the LFS book. So now we're going to create a normal user to build the first part of LFS. Um, as it says, a single mistake could destroy the system, the host system that is. So to prevent that, we'll create a group for this temporary user and add it to the system. Uh, user called LFS and it will use that group as well which is created which is also called LFS. Now we need to change or set a password for it because the password is currently unknown. And grant LFS full access to all the directories under LFS by making LFS the owner. So we'll change the ownership first of all of all those directories we created and you can see it's changed them from root to LFS and also the lib64 as well if we're on a 64-bit system which we are. Um, in some host systems the following SU command does not complete properly and suspends the login for the LFS user to the background. Yeah this used to happen to me, it hasn't happened for a while, touch wood. Um, but I'd, I'd also found myself that entering FG will just bring um, the command to the foreground and complete it. So let's try it and see what happens now. I don't believe this would happen and it hasn't. Um, it doesn't seem to happen with Gen 2. So now we've become the LFS user. 
We need to set up the environment. So we need to add a bash profile for this user. And it's, it describes there what's happening here. And we need to create a new bash RC file with some settings here as well. So we'll just copy this all in as well and go through it just tells you what each of these commands does so the first one turns off the bashes hash uh, function which is like a way of caching um, searches i believe yeah it switches off the hash function forces the shell to search the path whenever a program is run so it means that the, anything any tool that we compile fresh it's going to use that pick up that fresh one immediately rather than uh, remembering that it had a previous version and still using the older version. Uh, this is all about the permissions, the default permissions, um, default location for the LFS system, uh, the localization set to POSIX by default, um, the target is for the cross compiling, the path. Many modern distributions have merged bin and user bin. When this is the case, the standard path variable should set to user bin. So it just says it needs to uh, be set like that. And if bin is not a symbolic link, it must be added to the path variable. Uh, same with tools bin. That needs to exist for the temporary tools so we can access those, those tools that we'll be building. Um, this bit here is for the configure scripts, if this variable is not set, the scripts may attempt to load configuration items specific to some distribution. So this overrides that. And then the export um, exports all of those variables um, to make them visible with any subshells. Otherwise, they only exist in the current, current shell and wouldn't exist in any shell. Um, several commercial distributions add an undocumented instantiation of etc bash bash source to initialize uh, to the initialization of bash. This file has the potential to modify the LFS user's environment in ways that can affect the building of critical LFS packages. To make sure the LFS user's environment is clean, check for the presence of etc bash bash rc, and if present, move it out of the way. Um, I believe this is a problem more to do with any Debian-based distributions, uh, possibly others, but I think it's more to do with that. Gen 2, I don't think, suffers from this problem. It doesn't. You can see that the move command has got the verbose option on, but nothing's been put out to the screen. So this file doesn't exist. It hasn't done anything. So um, as always, just run that command in. You won't have to worry about checking yourself or if you if you do need to do it or not, just run it and it will do the right thing for you. Um, for many modern systems with multiple processors or cores, the compilation time for a package can be reduced by performing a parallel make by telling the make program how many processors are available via a command line option or an environment variable. For instance, an Intel Core i9 13900K processor has eight performance cores and 16 efficiency cores and a p-core can simultaneously run two threads so that each p-core are modeled as two logical cores by the Linux kernel. As a result, there are 32 logical cores in total. One obvious way to use all these logical cores is to allow make to spawn up to 32 build jobs. This can be done by passing minus J32 to make, or we can set the environment variable um, make flags to that option so um, it says never pass a j option without a number to make or set such to an option in make flags doing j yeah doing so will allow make to spawn an infinite number of build jobs um, i've done this by accident building the kernel and unless you've got gallons of memory i think even this 128 gigabyte machine wouldn't be able to cope with a large linux build linux kernel build it would just spawn too many and run out of memory um, so yeah be careful of that um, so what we can do here is to modify this bash rc file and add, add the make flags um, 
to the bash RC. So if you use Vi and just go down to the bottom, we can copy and paste this and just change that to 16. Uh, because I've got 16 cores, if you remember. Uh, oops, what have I done there? Save that. Um, is it NPROC? Tells you how many cores are available to, to use or how many threads that the make can use. Um, oh, okay. In fact, so they've got a command here now to do this. This never used to be here. So if I actually delete that, we can run that command <clears throat> to see it in action. And it does actually use NPROC. So we copy all this all in. And now look at that file. You can see at the end there it's added in. Oh, it actually runs NPROC each time uh, we enter the LFS user. So this, this script gets run every time we log into the LFS user. And that means that every time NPROC will be run and it would set this value correctly for make flags every time we log in. Or we do what we're going to do next, which is source bash profile. That should also source bash RC. So if we now do echo dollar make file. Um, okay, we need to source bash RC. I thought that normally loads bash RC, but it hasn't. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to log out, log back in again, and now make file. Oh, sorry, it's make flags. <laughs> right, I don't know why I did make file, it's make flags. And there it is, J16. So that's all working correctly. Now this will only be set for the time that we're in the LFS, which is only the first part of building Linux from scratch. When we come to doing Chroot, we'll have to set it again. So I'm actually wondering, because I've got this command in here to set the make flags now, which, as I say, is something new. Um, I'm wondering if they'll have that for the Chroot. So I'll have to try and remember that if it's not there, that we need to set it again. But uh, I'm assuming that it is going to be there. So a quick note about SBUs. A lot of information there about how the SBU is calculated. Um, and it does say when multiple processes are used in this way, the, the units will vary more, even more than they would. Um, and sometimes it even fails. So you might have to uh, revert to a single processor to find out why it's failed. And it could be sometimes, and it does mention this in the book at the appropriate moment, that you need to compile just on one core to, to make a successful compile. But the book will tell us when we need to do that. Um, it says the times here presented using four cores. Um, so again, you know, whenever I do this, I always find that the numbers work very wildly. That in fact they always vary quite a lot when it was only single cores. Um, it's something that can't be helped. There's no other real way, I guess, of um, getting a more accurate um, measurement. The one thing it is useful for, useful for is for seeing which packages are going to take a few minutes and which are going to take maybe several hours. Um, so it does give you um, a good indication in, in that respect. Um, but in terms of like, is it going to take 30 minutes or 35 minutes? Um, it's not going to be that accurate. It will tell you if it's going to take half an hour or an hour. Uh, it's that sort of accuracy or inaccuracy. Uh, but it is what it is. It's the best we've got at the moment. <clears throat> uh, test suites. Um, always recommend running test suites. It's the only way that you're going to guarantee, as it says there, that the package is totally bug free, that it's compiled correctly, that your system's been stable enough to compile it correctly, uh, that there hasn't been any other influences that have caused the build to fail in some way. You, in fact, sometimes the build might might successfully complete, and yet it will fail um, the tests, and it may be because of some other reason, or the build has built, 
in what seems a successful way, but it, it actually isn't when it uh, is run against the test. Um, and it can help prevent failures later on if you've built stuff and not tested it. Uh, you could find some packages have failed because of something that hasn't been uncovered during the build phase, but would have been uncovered during the actual testing phase. Um, as it says, it's pointless testing in Chapter 5 and Chapter 6 because we're still reliant on the host, and that might introduce some side effects with the test. So it kind of makes the results of those tests meaningless. And it could be that even the, the uh, frameworks for those tests aren't, actually set up correctly to to be useful anyway or to to allow tests to run uh, to completion so chapter eight is where the testing will be done strictly um i will be testing and i thoroughly recommend that you take time to test even if you're on a, mo a slow machine uh allow time for testing don't rush and try to complete uh Linux from scratch especially if it's your first time obviously if you've done it before you you'll know where hazards are, where you're likely to fall over, or things are likely to fail or break, or even how to fix things if they do break. Um, but yeah, if, if it's your first time or you're still new to Linux from scratch, uh, really recommend doing the test, take time to do it.